Hello, my name is Mark Allen of Bellingham, Washington, and I would like to talk about the mechanical television exhibit for the Spark Museum here in Bellingham, Washington. Mechanical television existed in the 1920s prior to the invention of modern electronic television that happened around the 1930s. Mechanical television worked basically using a metal disc with holes drilled around the edge. I'll show you details later. This disc is called the Nipco disc, named after Paul Nipco, who invented this disc in 1885. Mechanical television used signals that were transmitted over AM radio. The signals were generated by a mechanical camera with a disc similar to this that scanned a subject and the light levels returned from the subject created electrical pulses that were amplified and sent out a radio transmitter. The radio receiver would pick up the signals, amplify them, and then apply them to a special neon bulb like this. This is a large aperture neon bulb that would allow a scanning disk to be seen. And that bulb would flicker with the pulses from the um, transmitter. The Spark Museum is pleased to own two mechanical television receivers. One of them is behind me. This is called a kit mechanical television. It was sold in parts and you were to assemble it and use it for experimenting using mechanical television broadcasts over radio. Over here is a Baird televisor. John Baird of England came out with this. This was the first fully built operational television receiver offered to the public in the 1920s. It operates in a similar manner to the kit television. It's just that the disc is inside a decorative cabinet. Next, I'm going to show you a close-up of the work that I had to do. Here you can see a close-up of the Nikov disk. First of all, you can see the holes drilled in a spiral pattern around the edge of the disk. I turn the disk slowly. You can see the holes start to form a moving line. In front of the disc is a magnifying glass to magnify the image. Behind the disc is a large aperture neon bulb. The Baird televisor came out in the early 1920s in Great Britain. This was used to receive mechanical television broadcasts from the British Broadcasting Corporation. Over here is the viewport through which you see the image. The two controls here and here are used to facilitate synchronizing the spinning disk with the image being transmitted. Mechanical television was never very consistent for synchronization, so often required constant attention to the motor speed control, which is this control, and the phase of the synchronizing magnet, which is this control. I'm going to open this unit up to let you briefly see what's inside. What you see here is the Baird televisor with the cabinet removed. It is fairly simple. This is a Nikov disk. You may not see the holes because they're very, very small. In this, on to the right is the viewport. Behind the viewport, you cannot see it, is an LED array. 
This was a neon bulb during the period. However, we at the museum had found that the neon bulb was too dim to be viewed in a museum setting with these small holes. Back in the period, this unit was viewed in a completely dark room. In the center of the unit, of course, is the electric motor to drive the disc. Behind the electric motor right here, this is a synchronization brake. This would receive electrical pulses that were at the same rate as each of the lines of the image or each one of the holes. This was quite rudimentary in operation and was not completely reliable. The motor speed control is here and the, mag the magnet phase control is here. What this control does is simply move the magnet, the magnet unit side by side like this to facilitate phase or synchronization of the magnet to the motor. The system would lose synchronization whenever the image changes and when there is a very dark image because the synchronization signal level is very close to that of the dark video level. When, that, when there's a lot of darkness, then there was not much of a pulse that went to the magnet and the system can easily lose synchronization. Now I'm going to try to show you operation. What you see here is the viewport of the kit mechanical television. You probably can see two images going on. The reason you see multiple images is that there is no aperture in front of the spinning disc. And the size of the magnifying glass is about three images wide. But at least I hope this sees you what people in that era saw when they watched mechanical television. Here I'm trying to show you both the flashing neon bulb that you can see behind the spinning wheel and see the bulb through the wheel. I want to show you that there is no image on the bulb itself. The image is caused by the rotating of the wheel in synchronization with the flashing bulb. What you see now is the image as it appears in the viewport of the Baird televisor. I'd like to point out that the neon bulb that was originally in the televisor has been replaced by an LED array because we felt that the neon bulb was too dim for a museum setting. However, I would like to demonstrate what synchronization was like during the period. Because right now these pictures are automatically synchronized. So the viewer does not have to synchronize it. But let's go ahead and take the Baird out of automatic synchronization. You notice that the picture is now no longer in sync. I'm going to attempt to manipulate the motor speed control to synchronize the image. There, right about there, we're seeing an image that we're synchronizing. We had to constantly do that because synchronization was not very reliable. But that's your experience on the Baird.
What you see here is the signal processing unit that I had to make to simulate the mechanical television signals that were received over the radio during the period when mechanical television was used. As I said before, those signals were generated by a mechanical camera and then a radio transmitter. Since the museum does not have those items, what we chose to do is to use a computerized method to generate the special images. Here in this chassis, we have a computer in the back. It happens to be a Raspberry Pi, for those of you who are familiar. That takes an animated GIF file and converts the images to those that are suitable for the mechanical television. Then we convert those digital signals to analog signals here, condition them here, and then send them to the kit over here and the Baird over here. I will talk about the detail in, of the construction and operation of this system in another video. However, I would like to point out that due to the generosity of the museum and its curators, Jonathan Winter and John Jenkins, about 90% of the components I use for the converter or processor came from the museum. This allowed me to focus my efforts on making this exhibit work for the museum and most likely save the museum over three to five hundred dollars of parts and labor. For example, the chassis came from a piece of scrap metal at the museum, which I cut using a plasma cutter and TIG welded together. The power transformer came from an old radio that we sacrificed at the museum. That probably saved me a couple hundred dollars from having one custom made. And very interestingly, if you see the silverware that's used to support or hold these power supplies, those came from the dumpster at the Watkin Museum's light catcher building, as if somebody in the restaurant accidentally threw the silverware away. I am putting it, hopefully, to wise reuse. I hope to have helped you understand what mechanical television was and what it looks like in the years prior to the inventions of modern electronic television. For those of you planning to come here to Bellingham, Washington and visit the Spark Museum of Electrical Invention, we hope to have this exhibit on the display floor by the end of fall or beginning of winter 2017. Although, as I demonstrated, the exhibit does work, we have a bit of cosmetic work to do. For example, a clear acrylic case for the mechanical television to protect little fingers from getting hurt, and a case for the video processing unit to protect everyone from getting hurt on high voltages. If you are interested in trying to do this yourself for your own education, I would like to please invite you to watch another videotape that I have on my channel, which is Mark Allen, I'll spell that as A-L-L-Y-N. That video explains this operation in full detail. I chose to undertake this project because I wanted to try to take the skills that I have developed in electronics starting from childhood. I ran a TV repair shop in grade school. I built an oscilloscope for junior high school, and then I worked on computer software for my career. I, would, I wanted to take those skills and apply them to benefit for the museum and education for the public at large. This project was quite long, frustrating, but most importantly, very, very fun. 
I volunteer as a docent at the museum every Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and Saturday from about noon to about 3 p.m. If you are at the museum, please ask for me. My name is Mark Allen, and I will be more than glad to explain to you in person how the exhibit works and what I had to do here to do the signal processing for the digital images so they can be presented on a 1920s vintage neon bulb. Thank you for viewing and I hope to see you at the museum.